there, my name is Dr. Dorothy Buckley, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to this video where we'll be discussing eyewitness memory. So I want you to imagine for a moment that you are a juror in a case involving serious assault. You find it very hard to decide whether the defendant is, indeed, the person who carried out this vicious assault. This is because nearly all of the evidence is indirect or circumstantial, and so not very convincing. However, one piece of evidence that seems very direct and revealing is that the person who was assaulted identifies the defendant as her assailant in a lineup. When you see this eyewitness questioned in court, you are impressed by her confidence that she has correctly identified her attacker. As a result, you and your fellow jurors find the defendant guilty of serious assaults, and he is sentenced to several years in prison. Now, as you may have guessed, this is actually not a just a thought experiment, but rather it's a circumstance that was true by uh, for at least 200 people that were convicted of a crime as a result of eyewitness testimony and later exonerated using DNA evidence as a result of the uh, Innocence Project. So one such individual was a man by the name of Ronald Cotton, who Jennifer Thompson identified as her rapist. Um, and Ronald Cotton, as it happens, was innocent, and he met the actual perpetrator of the crime while he was in prison. So the actual perpetrator of the crime, um, Bobby Poole, was later convicted of the crime um, when DNA results revealed that Ronald Cotton was not guilty. So this case raises a lot of really important questions, the most important of which is, should jurors trust confident witnesses? Is it safe for jurors to rely almost solely on eyewitness testimony? Simmons and Chabri in 2011 found that 37% of Americans believed the testimony of a single eyewitness, uh, confident eyewitness is sufficient to convict a criminal defendant. However, the increased use of DNA testing in recent years has suggested that there are significant dangers associated with relying on eyewitness identification. Because like I said, 200 individuals who were, uh, who were uh, convicted as a result of eyewitness testimony were later exonerated by DNA evidence. Uh, note, however, that DNA tests are not infallible. They can indicate whether or not someone was present at a crime scene, but not necessarily that they committed the crime. So should jurors trust confident witnesses? Garrett, in 2011, reviewed 161 cases of mistaken identification that was later exonerated by DNA evidence. Nearly all eyewitnesses identifying a totally innocent individual were certain at trial, okay, and I want you to note that distinction, at trial, they were certain at trial that they had actually identified the culprit. This suggests that eyewitness memory, eyewitnesses have extremely fallible memories and that the confidence they express in their identifications at trial should be disregarded. Interestingly, however, when Garrett uh, reviewed trial transcripts, they indicated that when eyewitnesses initially reported a lack of certainty about their, um, or I should say that differently. So in cases where a witness was later exonerated by DNA evidence, the eyewitness at least initially Expressed, ex expressed a lack of certainty about their identification. So in 57% of cases where a, a criminal defendant was later exonerated, in 57% of those cases, initially the eyewitness had been uncertain as to whether their identification was correct. Right? Um, it's also worth noting that there are many factors that can influence eyewitness confidence that have nothing to do with the actual recollection. 
So why does eyewitness confidence often increase substantially from initial identification to their final courtroom identification? Well, in the case of Jennifer Thompson, she became, she became gradually more confident in her identification um, when she, repeat, she received positive feedback from the police. Right? So essentially, when she identified Ronald Cotton, um, the police essentially told her, yes, that is our number one suspect, so it's not surprising that you identified that individual. And when Steblay and colleagues conducted a 2014 meta-analysis, there was a strong tendency for participants uh, to remember mistakenly that they had been confident about the accuracy of their identification prior to receiving positive feedback, even though that wasn't the case, right? So positive feedback not only uh, changes your memory for the original event, it also substantially increases your confidence in the accuracy of that identification. So what conclusions can we draw based on this paper? Well, first, it appears that we can trust eyewitnesses' confidence in their identifications, provided we consider only their initial level of confidence. Further support for this conclusion comes from a real-life study of eyewitnesses' initial identifications. So only approximately 20% of eyewitness identifications of culprits were correct when initial confidence was low, but when initial confidence was high, there was accurate identification um, in 80% of cases later on. Okay, so initial confidence seems to be a very reliable predictor of accuracy in eyewitness identifications. So another interesting question that um, cognitive psychologists studying eyewitness memory have kind of grappled with is how knowledgeable are judges and lawyers and police officers about the factors that lead to, um, how knowledgeable are they about the factors that decrease the accuracy of eyewitness testimony? Well, wise and safer, and you guys can appreciate the irony of someone studying uh, the intersection between psychology and the criminal justice system having the last name safer. I certainly appreciate that. But anyway, wise and safer in 2024 conducted a study with American judges as participants, and they found that judges cite substantially underestimated the importance of factors causing eyewitness testimony to be inaccurate. And as a result, 77, a whopping 77, almost 80% of judges were willing to accept that a defendant should be convicted of a crime based solely on eyewitness testimony. And when the same authors conducted a subsequent study in 2010, they found that American judges' knowledge of factors influencing the accuracy of eyewitness testimony was comparable to that of undergraduate students. The findings strongly suggest that the number of wrongful convic convictions based on eyewitness testimony could be dramatically reduced if judges had accurate knowledge about the, the limitations of eyewitness testimony. And in a third study conducted in 2011, the authors reviewed 23 studies where the knowledge of the impact of various factors on eyewitness accuracy was assessed among jurors who are ordinary citizens or lay people. And fortunately, their views did agree with expert consensus on eyewitness testimony 66% um, of the time. So for about 66% of the relevant knowledge of, of the factors that influence eyewitness testimony, the jurors were correct. But what that means is that in one th for about 33% um, of the relevant factors were unknown to jurors. So really what all of these studies suggest is that more um, attention needs to be spent in the literature 
about how to uh, adequately apprise jurors and judges and lawyers and police officers about um, eyewitness testimony. So most of you probably since intro or even AP psychology are familiar with what the misinformation effect is. But just in case you haven't um, heard of that before, I have inserted a video clip from Elizabeth Loftus. Um, it's a TED Talk and it's really interesting. Um, so I would encourage you to go ahead and watch that if you have time. Um, but one of the most obvious explanations for the inaccuracy of eyewitness testimony is that they often fail to pay sufficient attention to the crime that's being committed and the criminals. After all, the crime they observe typically occurs suddenly and the events unfold in an unpredictable or surprising way, right? However, Loftus and Palmer in 1974 argued that what matters is not only what happens during the crime, but also what happens after the crime. So in the classic study conducted by Loftus and Palmer in 1974, participants watched a short film of a traffic accident and they were later asked questions about the accident. And what the experimenters manipulated was the wording used on those questions. So there were three groups of participants and this was a between subject manipulation. So some subjects were asked, how fast was the red car going when it contacted the blue car? Other participants were asked, how fast was the car going when it hit the blue car? And a third percentage of participants were asked, how fast was the car going when it smashed into the other car? And so one sort of uh, interesting, but maybe n uh, less consequential finding um, is that people are really, really bad at estimating the actual speed of motor vehicles, which is interesting and kind of funny, actually. Um, probably why people get so many traffic tickets. But anyway, um, the more relevant finding is that as the verbiage utilized became more emphatic, the estimates of speed became faster, right? So when the word contacted was used, the MPH estimate was 30, but when the word smash was used, the MPH estimate was uh, 40, right? So it seemed that participants' memory for the event was not only influenced by the event itself, but the questions that they were asked about the event after it happened. And an even more striking example of this was when they brought participants in a week later and asked them a simple yes or no question, did you see broken glass? Um, only 14% of the hit group said yes, but an overwhelming 34% of the smashed group did. Okay, And so what that means is that simply seeing the word smashed alters participants' recollection so that it's more consistent with their schema of what happens if a car smashes into another car, which is that you have damage to the vehicle in the form of, of broken glass. So again, participants' recollection of, event, of an event is determined by not just what happens during the event, but the questions or information they are exposed to after the event. Okay, so I'm going to show you another example. So if you were a participant in this um, study by Loftus and colleagues, you would see a video very much like this. Okay, so it's a car accident, right? So you watch that video, and one week later you're asked, how fast was the car going when it went past the yield sign? Okay, so the, the misinformation in this case is the yield sign. They actually saw a stop sign, not a yield sign. And in another uh, question they were asked is, identify the pair of slides that you saw um, previously, and the majority of subjects picked the wrong slide, 
right? So again, being asked a simple question about the event can mislead participants and change their recollection of the event. Um, so a lot of textbooks um, are sort of <laughs> misleading about the misinformation effect in the sense that they kind of portray it as a, a universal phenomenon that everyone is susceptible to. But in fact, there are considerable differences in who will and who will not demonstrate a, a misinformation effect. And one of the biggest predictors of not falling prey to misinformation is having both higher intelligence and an associated greater working memory capacity. So individuals with a high IQ with a, and with a fairly robust working memory capacity are better able to uh, identify misinformation and they fail to integrate that misinformation into their recollection of the event. Right. And if we th we put our thinking caps on and, and and jump in a time machine back to the module where we discussed um, working memory, that makes sense. Right. Because we have our central executive and the function of the central executive is to sort of be a conflict detector. Right. So the central executive and to some extent also the episodic buffer. Um, is responsible for taking the information that's currently in our consciousness and reconciling it or, or integrating it with information in our long-term memory, right? So when we do that, when we integrate incoming information with old information, right, then we can identify discrepancies or misinformation. So people with a larger working memory capacity are better able to do that and to detect the misinformation. So the ability to uh, resist information is also associated with a variety of personality characteristics, and I don't actually have as good of an explanation for that. Um, these are just correlational studies, so they found that these participants tend to have certain personality characteristics, so a high fear of negative evaluation, low in cooperativeness, and reward dependence, right? So I guess in some sense it makes sense if, you, if you're afraid of negative evaluation, you don't want to get the answer incorrect, or you don't want to fall for some sort of a scheme, right? If you're low in cooperativeness, maybe your sense of trust around others is low, um, things like that. Okay. Um, another thing to note, right, is uh, all of the uh, studies investigating the misinformation effect, or certainly the most um, the most well known studies of the misinformation effect, have all focused on extremely inconsequential, fairly minor peripheral details, such as the presence of, of broken glass or whether something was a yield or a stop sign. So really, even though people mix those details up, those details don't seem to be very central to the actual event itself, right? So Putnam and colleagues in 2017 confirmed that, that the misinformation effect is much, much greater for unmemorable, relatively un unimportant details than memorable details. Um, so like I said, most textbook accounts of the misinformation effect make it seem like everybody falls victim to this, um, but that's very much not the case. And in fact, in some cases, the presence of misinformation can actually enhance your recollection for the original event. So, for example, Putnam et al. discovered that misinformation actually helped people recognize the event that actually happened, provided the participants detected and remembered the, dis the discrepancy between the original event and the post-event misinformation. Right. So if you put yourself in the shoes of the person um, in the study, right, if you're told how fast was the car going uh, when it passed the yield sign, you know, if you're then prompted when you hear yield sign to go, wait a minute, I thought it was a stop sign and then kind of replay it in your head. Right. Um, then that yield sign can cause you to kind of pause and go, wait a minute, I think it was a stop sign, right? So again, highly intelligent people with a greater working memory capacity 
uh, are much more likely to identify that misinformation and detect the discrepancy. Um, and in that case, their memory for the actual event can actually be um, uh, enhanced. So why is that the case? Like I said, misinformation acted as a retrieval cue that facilitated recollection of the actual details for the event. Okay, so a couple other details about the misinformation effect. One key issue is whether misinformation causes permanent alteration of memory traces, right? So one way to think about it is, does the misinformation effect kind of corrupt your mental file, right? So that the actual file stored on the hard drive of your memory becomes corrupted with the incorrect details, or does your memory for the event splinter off into two recollections, one story that you actually saw and one story that you heard post-event, right? So which one is true? Well, in their study, Oberst and Blink, told eyewitnesses that they had received contradictory information and encouraged them to recall everything that they could related to the event and the misinformation or post-event information. And this manipulation had a dramatic effect. When they were told, you were exposed to misinformation and I want you to think of everything you can possibly remember, Okay, that again activated this discrepancy detector where people were able to um, identify the, the misinformation and give an accurate um, recollection of the event. Okay, um, so interestingly, a lot of studies have been conducted looking at the, uh, the efficacy of giving people a warning that they may have been exposed to misleading information. Um, and Blank and, uh, or Hyman, Blank and Luna in 2017 compared the effects of warnings that were specific, okay? So warnings th that are specific would be, we told you it was a yield sign, in fact, it was a stop sign, right? Or just a general warning saying, we lied about some stuff, sorry about that, right? And they found that the misinformation effect was only eliminated with um, specific warnings, which makes sense. So again, one of the things we have to question, right, is what happens in the misinformation effect, right? If, if there's damage to the copy of the memory on our hard drive or in our, in our brains, right? That would suggest that the details, the, the wrong details that we're exposed to in the post-event misinformation would be permanently hardwired in our brain. Whereas another recollection is that maybe we have two memories now, the real memory and the false memory, right? So to kind of suss this out, Edelson and colleagues in 2011 had eyewitnesses watch a crime scene in small groups and then recall the crime events in a group um, three days later. Four days after that, they were told that their fellow eyewitnesses remembered several events differently from them, and they were given a further test, okay? But that second test, test two, was actually a ruse. So test two was actually the, a misinformation condition where they were told all of this fake information that supposedly the other group members had recalled. Um, and so this mis misinformation condition caused many eyewitnesses to recall incorrect information corresponding to the alleged memories of their fellow eyewitnesses. Okay, and then a week later, the researchers came clean and said, actually, nobody, nobody in your group actually had those recollections. We just lied to you. Um, and so they tested them again a third time, um, seeing if they had accurate recollection. Um, and some eyewitnesses continued to provide the incorrect information. So it seems that in some cases, our file on our hard drive actually does get corrupted and our memory for the original event is fundamentally changed as a result of misinformation. Okay. So in another study by um, Zip Talik and Palik 
in 2019. Um, they presented eyewitnesses with a four minute video clip of a burglary, followed by a post event narrative that contained misleading information. And then they used what they called reinforced self affirmation to reduce the misinformation effect. So basically, participants wrote down one of their greatest achievements in life, and they then received feedback or positive feedback concerning their memory, perception, or independence of judgment. And basically, this reinforced self-affirmation dramatically reduced the misinformation effect because it increased participants' self-confidence and self-independence, right? So what that suggests is that in many cases, the misinformation effect occurs because people just aren't confident in their recollection anymore, right? So if the questions on the post-event questionnaire or the misinformation condition don't align with your actual memory, right, you might change that memory to better conform under the assumption that you were incorrect. Right? So in some ways, the misinformation effect is, is very similar to conformity effects that were studied by Solomon Ash. Right? So the difference between uh, different types of social influence. Right? So people said that the line was longer, not because they actually perceived it that way, but because they assumed that the group knew something they didn't. Right? So perhaps the reason why the misinformation occurs, at least in some cases, is because um, the participants aren't confident in their memory of the event, and so they changed it to align to the misinformation account that they were given. Okay. So another um, critical issue uh, when it comes to eyewitness memory um, is actually helping people to identify the right person when they're looking in a lineup. So there's considerable evidence indicating that eyewitness performance is rather fallible when they attempt to select the culprit from a lineup. So for example, Valentine, Valentine Pickering and Darling in 2003 analyzed the findings from 640 eyewitnesses who tried to identify suspects in 314 real lineups. And what they found is that only 40% of witnesses identified the suspect, 20% identified a non-suspect, and the remaining 40% failed to make an identification. So really, people do struggle significantly to make an identification in any kind of lineup. Um, we can also talk about the uh, different types of lineups. So for example, with double blind administration, the lineup is conducted by administrators who don't know which member of the lineup is the suspect, whereas with single blind administration in contrast, they have such knowledge, right? So guilty suspects are identified more often using single blind administration, right? But that could be because whoever is present that knows who the suspect is might be giving off some kind of implicit signal to the participant that that's the guilty party, right? So lineups can be simultaneous, where the eyewitness sees everyone at the same time, or sequential, where the eyewitness sees only one person at a time. So Wells and colleagues in 2015 carried out a large study involving eyewitnesses to actual crimes, okay? And their study was more realistic than laboratory studies because they used eyewitnesses of actual crimes. Um, and they also gave people the option of saying not sure when they were given a lineup. And they found that first, the suspect was identified 25% 20 of the time with both simultaneous and sequential lineups. Second, there were more incorrect identifications of an innocent person with a simultaneous lineup than a sequential. And third, eyewitnesses used the not sure response more often with sequential lineups. In a subsequent study, Wixted and colleagues also studied real eyewitnesses to crimes, and they found that eyewitnesses identified 91% of suspects who had um, independent evidence of guilt, 
So they had other evidence implicating them as the suspect besides the eyewitness identification. And they did that in 91% of cases with a simultaneous lineup um, compared to only 76% of the time with sequential lineups. Thus, there is a greater probability of identifying the culprit with simultaneous than sequential lineups. However, innocent indi individuals are more likely to um, be identified as the culprit with simultaneous lineups, right? So you increase your, your probability of identifying the correct uh, suspect with simultaneous lineups, but you also increase the probability of identifying the wrong suspect. Um, so I'm gonna do a little bit of an aside here because I can. Um, so I, I want you guys to kind of, um, as you're watching this video, you can raise your hand, yay or nay, um, if you watch Criminal Minds. Right. And, and there's really no situation in which I would I would intentionally tell you to watch that show um, because it's depiction of the behavioral analysis unit and and forensic psychology is, is pretty abysmal in almost every aspect. Um, but the one aspect that is correct is the usage of something called the cognitive interview. Um, so, so despite the inaccuracies of Criminal Minds, I do watch it on a fairly regular basis. So if you're like me and you've seen lots of uh, episodes of Criminal Minds, I want you to think about a typical case, and I apologize if, if some of you haven't seen the show. This is kind of an aside. But I want you to imagine something that happens a lot on the show, right? So we'll say, you know, um, somebody witnesses a crime and they're having difficulty conjuring up a memory of that event. So what happens a lot in the show is, you know, Dr. Spencer Reed or, or um, Jennifer Jarrell will take the person to um, the scene of the crime, which for some reason always happens at like an abandoned warehouse or by the train tracks or something. I don't, know, I don't know if that reflects real life. Um, but so so they take them to the original scene of the crime and then they have them close their eyes and think about what they saw, okay, and what they heard and what they smelled and what they felt and maybe what they were thinking, okay? And so this is referred to as mental reinstatement of the environmental and the internal context, right? So we know from our episodic memory uh, module that uh, memory retrieval is significantly cue dependent, right? And so the cues in your physical environment and also the cues generated by your mood, your uh, state, whether you're, you know, under the influence of alcohol or drugs, um, can, can greatly influence whether you retrieve something, okay? So mentally thinking about what you saw, heard, felt, smelled, and were thinking reinstates uh, um, uh, some of those cues. And, and having generated some of those cues, you're more likely to recall the event, right, is the idea. Um, a lot of times, an, another crucial component of um, the cognitive interview is encouraging the witness to report every single detail, regardless of how trivial or unimportant it may seem. Um, when they originally conceptualized of the cognitive interview, um, they also had people recall the incident in several different orders and also from several different perspectives. But subsequent research revealed that those actually weren't important components um, and they didn't drive accuracy of recall as much as mental reinstatement of the environment and um, encouraging reporting of every detail did. Um, and something that they do now that also increases the probability of recall um, is to have people organize their memories into categories. 
right? So details of the culprit, culprit, details of the location, action details, conversation details, things like that. And we know again from the episodic memory module um, that organization is another way of greatly in increasing the likelihood that you'll be able to recall something. Okay, so we've talked about misinformation, which is um, uh, recollecting incorrect details, but it's also possible to um, recall whole entire events that never took place, right? So, so one example of this is in certain cases, entire events can be implanted into someone's memory so that that person recalls confidently and in detail an event that never took place. Um, so for example, cognitive psychologists um, have implanted false memories of having been hospitalized as a child overnight uh, for a high fever. Um, they've implanted false memories of having um, spilt a bowl of punch at a wedding as a youngster. Um, they've implanted false memories of having um, been lost in a shopping mall. And they've implanted false memories of uh, having taken a, a hot air balloon ride as a child. Um, and all of these events are fictitious. They never actually happened. Um, and another example is having been uh, attacked by a wild animal. Um, so again, these are highly emotional, um, somewhat traumatic events that some people produce detailed recollections of, even though it never happened. So in the false memory induction procedure, um, basically what happens is experimenters ask um, participant, uh, participants about particular uh, events uh, from their childhood um, that in uh, fact never actually happened. Um, so typically what they do is researchers tell uh, participants that uh, they have um, spoken to their parents and other family members um, about specific events um, and then they ask them to recall them. Um, and in fact, some of the events are true, um, but other events are false. So they get uh, both true memories and a characteristic um, false memory and ask participants to recall them. And they want to, and they tell them they want to see how much the individual can remember. So um, about the event, right? So in fact, the experimenters do contact a family member, but they, uh, in, in some cases, they get true events, and in other cases, they just confirm that the false event didn't actually happen to the participant. And the participants might be asked about the time as a young child, like I said, they spilled punch on a, on, um, a bride's wedding dress or the time they took a ride in a hot air balloon. Um, so whenever they're asked those questions, um, all the participants initially, because the event never happened, will deny remembering the event. However, in the false memory induction procedure, experiments will repeatedly and kind of leadingly question the participant about such memories. In some cases, people do start to remember events that never took place. So for example, Loftus and Pickrell in 1995 recruited 24 participants and they tried to convince themselves, the participants, that they got lost in a shopping mall as a child when in fact they had not. Participants were repeatedly questioned about this event as if it had taken place and were also asked to imagine themselves back in the mall. Although most of the participants never generated false memories of being lost in a shopping mall, 25% did. So six of the 24 participants remembered partial or complete details of the never experienced event. Um, 
And this was replicated um, by other um, researchers as well using a similar paradigm, right? So repeated questioning combined with the authority of a close family member leads some participants to create false memories. So the rate of false memory induction is relatively low. At best, it reaches rates of about 50% for some memories that are ordinary and not traumatic, right? Such as taking a ride in a hot air balloon. For some items, it remains at zero. So for example, if you ask about something embarrassing, like whether or not someone received an enema as a child, um, they won't usually recollect that as being true. In most cases, it takes the form of accepting the wisdom of the parent or sibling. That is, the belief that the event must have occurred, but they just can't remember it, right? So if mom says it's true, it must be true, even though I can't actually recollect the experience. However, in some cases, the participants wind up not just believing the event occurred, but also elaborating on the event, providing details that were not presented to them. Um, and in these cases, the participant truly has an autobiographical uh, episodic memory that just happens to not correspond to a real event. So for example, um, Highland, or Hyman and Pentland in 1996 found that 25% of participants wound up elaborating on and describing new details concerning events that never happened. So we can conclude from all of the data that we've talked about that human memory is susceptible to false memory, not all the time and not for all events, and perhaps not even for everyone. But by and large, false memories can and do occur. Right? So one question that remains is, can false memories of truly traumatic events occur? And if that is possible, is it ethical to induce these memories? Right? So that's, we're going to return to that question in just a moment. Okay. Um, so, uh, so for example, uh, Hyman and colleagues in 1998 found that the tendency to report false memories was positively correlated with the dissociative experiences scale and the creative imagination scale, right? Which makes sense because people who dissociate tend to be very imaginative and they tend to have an easy time considering things that aren't actually in their reality at present, right? So those individuals tend to be more likely to report um, and corroborate and even generate details about the false memory that were never presented. Um, and similarly, um, Hyman and Pentland in 1996 found that um, when uh, participants were asked to recall a series of true and false events, having access to images not only increased the recollection of true events, but also of false events as well. So for example, in one study, they doctored up a photo using Photoshop and basically presented participants with a photo of their childhood self um, floating in a water balloon, or water balloon, in a hot air balloon um, on a field trip, right? Um, and so in that case, 50% of the participants conceded that this event must be true. Um, in another study, they didn't doctor up a photo or uh, edit it in Photoshop at all. Um, they just presented it and basically made up a story of how the entire class had gotten in trouble on that particular picture day um, for misbehaving, right? And so all the participants uh, are, again, about 50% of the participants um, in, it were induced to believe that that was the case. But finally, returning to our last question of whether or not um, whether or not inducing traumatic events, okay, whether inducing memory false memories for traumatic events is unethical, right? And one of the one of the determinants of whether it's unethical or not is does inducing that false memory affect future behavior in some way? 
So in this study by Garrett and colleagues, um, they attempted to address this. So in this particular study, they um, implanted the false memory, <coughs> excuse me, they implanted the false memory that participants had gotten sick from eating some kind of unusual food, right? So maybe they ate egg, egg, an egg salad sandwich after it was left out in the sun, or maybe they ate strawberry ice cream and broke out in hives, right? So they implanted those false memories. And then a week later, they brought participants back. Um, and they found that people who had been given that false memory induction procedure about certain foods avoided those foods at the picnic. And so what that suggests is that in some cases, inducing false memory can actually change, fundamentally change the way that people uh, behave and even induce an avoidance of food. <coughs> so thank you so much for your attention. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you have a wonderful day.